Great. Now, we're, now we will begin. So hello, everyone. Welcome to Family Day. Welcome to the Royal BC Museum. My name is Chris O'Connor, and I'm a learning program developer here at the Royal BC Museum. The Royal BC Museum is located on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. And I live and work uh, on this land and so thankful to live, learn, raise a family uh, here. And it's really important when we're talking about a space like this. So right now, uh, we're in the collection tower of the museum. And this is where most of the collections, that means objects, specimens, belongings, documents, images, are in this tower. And it is said, though it's debated, but it's said that there's about 7 million things in this collection. And we're, and each of the floors of this tower hold a different kind of focus on that collection. So we're gonna go, myself and Elise, uh, who you'll meet in a moment, we're gonna go on a really quick um, tour to try to look at a, as many different things in as many different collections. One thing, one thing we're not gonna get to on this tour are the indigenous collections, so the indigenous belongings. Um, and that, so that will be another tour at another time but we're gonna look at the natural history collection and the non-indigenous uh, object collection as well, history collection. So I uh, will turn the camera around. Uh, I'm Chris and- I'm Elise and I'm a youth volunteer here. Um, and I'm We don't hear Elise yet, oh. sorry. And now you're disconnected. So we will wait one moment for Chris and Elise to come back from the tower. Here they come. And just to turn your camera sideways, Elise, so we get your picture back in the right direction. <laughs> there we go. And now you're muted and we're almost there. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? We hear you. Okay, good. Um, my name is Elise. I'm a youth volunteer here. Um, I'm still in high school, but I like spending time here at the museum and I do things with the learning team. Like I lead summer camps, do special programs, things like that. And I'm just excited to be here and learn with you guys. So, yeah. All right, so. Uh... Oops, we've lost the camera. Picture again. I think when the earphone comes out, maybe. They're just building tension for what we're going to see. <laughs> there you are. Hello. Sorry. So, now I hear you. I hear you, Chris. Great. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's kicking us out. <laughs> you, you never know what's gonna happen on the tour of the collection tower. So we're gonna start with the first thing here and we're, where we are right now in the collection tower is the herbarium. And that's the area that uh, where the collection of the plants, um, uh, mostly plants uh, of BC are. So there are hundreds of thousands of specimens and they're mostly all on these botanical sheets. So things like this. So you would do a collecting out in the field of um, usually if it's a plant, it's in bloom. And, and then you need to press it so that it's flat and it's preserved. So what we're looking at here is actually a, a white fawn lily. It's beautiful. I love the way that um, plants are um, pressed and how they're arranged on herbarium sheets like this. So they need to use a little bit of glue to, to, um, to, to make that stay. And you'll notice that it's a little different color, color that you would see than you would see out in the, in the wild because it's, uh, it does get faded some, but they try to keep it as much as possible into the color that it is. This is a white fawn lily. And one of the reasons why it's called a fawn lily is because the leaves here the, the coloration and the texture looks like a fawn. Um, and then with a sheet like this, what's really important in museums, what's most important is the data, the information for each specimen. So here you can see that it's part of the Provincial Museum, the Royal BC Museum, Plants of British Columbia, it says the Latin name, 
where it was collected, that's really, really important. So Denman Island uh, under a Douglas fir, Salt Spring Island. And, um, and then it also says exactly where it was found, the lat latitude and longitude. Who collected it? The date, so this is April, 1971. Um, there's an identification number. And then also who collected it, but then who identified it? When it came back to the museum, who said this is actually a white fawn lily, as opposed to maybe some other kind of um, plant that might, there are some things, so we'll, we'll walk this way. There are some things that within the museum might look like something, but is actually something else. So we have curators here at the museum that are experts in their field. They know exactly what they're looking at. They could do the research to make distinguish, like distinguish between different species. Um, and then they identify it and they say uh, what it actually is. And then it's part of the collection. So that was the bot uh, botanicals uh, collection or the herbarium. Now we've come into the paleontology section. And actually paleontology, because it's so big and also so heavy, We'll wait for Chris and Elise to get back into reception. They are in the Fannin Tower, which is that tall building beside the Royal BC Museum. There's lots of cement. <laughs> There's lots of big, heavy cases that are making our connection not as stable as we would like. If you have questions for Chris and Elise, you can put them into the chat. And if you're watching us on Facebook Live, you may uh, use the comment section and I will pass those questions along. Also, if you're watching on Zoom, just a reminder, there are also closed captions available and you can click the CC button to watch those. Now. Chris and Elise are still uh, back with us. I think they are finding a location with Wi-Fi. The Royal BC Museum started making its collections in 1886. So Chris and Elise, I see you're back. Your image is sideways and you are muted. Still sideways. <laughs> there we oh. go. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> it, it, it just, it was on the Zoom. yeah. Did you? When did that cut out? Um, you had just gone into the paleontology, so we haven't seen or we don't know the name of what you're looking oh, at. Oh, I was I was talking for a long time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So so we're looking at the paleontology collection has lots of different things from. Um, so many different eras and epochs, but uh, one thing that we have a lot of, because we find them a lot in BC, are woolly mammoth remains. Uh, so these three right here are woolly mammoth teeth from three different finds. And so that one is in a, in a little container that you can see there. This is really interesting, and it was found in Candle Creek um, that it's a whole jaw of a woolly mammoth. So you actually, this is the, basically the chin part of the woolly mammoth. Um, and this is the entire jaw bone on the side. And then on this side, you can see that it's uh, been broken away or worn away. And then here is a woolly mammoth um, tooth. And what's really interesting about this one is that here's the top of the woolly mammoth tooth. And then underneath, these kind of look like spikes or um, they almost look like they're, they're their own kind of teeth, but they're actually the roots of the tooth, of a woolly mammoth tooth. So having collections like this, having things that you could really look closely and see how uh, these teeth are constructed, um, all different parts of it are a really important part of museum collections. So we're gonna go up to the next floor. Hopefully we don't cut out again. Um, actually, maybe I'll take, I'll switch it over. Um, and 
So we were on the third floor and we're gonna go up to, um, we're gonna go up to the, actually the fifth floor now. So we're gonna walk up the stairs. Elise is gonna take the next section of this. So we're passing by the fourth floor. The fourth floor is the mammals um, collection floor. And the fifth floor um, we'll be getting up to momentarily. And how many floors yeah. are there, Chris? Well, that's a great question, Kim. Actually, if you go up to the museum, you'll see that there are 14 floors. But if you look really closely, you'll notice that there's not a 13th floor. I guess concern that maybe it's bad luck to have a 13th floor. So I guess that means we probably, well, we do have a basement as well. So probably all told we have 14 floors. So um, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Elise now. All right. So now we are in the ornithology collections. So those are like birds, little things like that. You can see all these big boxes around, but we're going to see something special. All right, so this right here, little bird, we have a couple. So we have this full one, we have these little parts, a certain part ones, and we have this one, which is in a big display. So these are called passenger pigeons. And what's special about passenger pigeons is that they are completely extinct. There are none left at all. And which is kind of weird because um, back in the early 1900s, they were actually the most abundant bird in North America. And they made up at least 25% of the bird population in North America. And why there were so many of them was because when they came together, um, they came together in these massive flocks and it was often it's been noted in many journals and things like that throughout history that whenever they came through, it was like a cloud that was coming over the horizon and that sometimes it, they would even darken the sun. And since they traveled in such huge flocks, um, the places that they would roost in or stay in, the trees um, would actually break. So they would be all just sitting, sitting there and uh, the trees that they're in would just break and they were in, they like to roost in very uh, dense forest areas, which meant that there were a lot of <laughs> trees broken. Um, and the reason they went extinct was mostly because of human intervention. Um, and I think the last one to exist, her name was Martha and she was in the Cincinnati Zoo in I think 1923. And she had a um, basically, she had a disease, so she wasn't able to fly or reproduce, so she didn't produce any viable offspring, which meant that the population died out. Um, yeah, so take a good look at those again. And often these can get, um, these pigeons can get mistaken for other doves or other pigeons or sometimes doves, um, which can lead to false reports, and there have been quite a few numbers of those. Yeah. So um, just jumping in, so it's, uh, so it's interesting with a museum collection like this that, oh yeah. So just jumping in here. So it's interesting with a museum collection like this, so at least that it's, uh, to ha be able to have something that doesn't exist anymore, is it shows how important a collection is. Just like we were looking at the mammoth teeth that you can't just go out and see a mammoth. So the collections are, uh, it's really important to be able to, to see and, and be able to understand these um, from specimens, especially if there's not, they're not around. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, it's just going this way. All right. So next we are going to go through here. You can see there's all of these big boxes 
around here. Each of them contain a number of different uh, species and uh, collections. So, uh, we lost them last time we came into the, <laughs> the tower stairwell. So I think they are moving up the stairs to our next collection area. Elise or Chris, when you, um, when you get some audio, you can let us know where we are heading next. You're back. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. So here we are on the sixth floor. You can see that's some wonderful fish. Um, so in here on this floor, we're not gonna be visiting it today, but we have the invertebrate laboratory. And so invertebrates are basically animals that don't have a spine. And out here you can see the lovely view <laughs> that we get to see. Yeah, all right. So we're gonna switch over again. And, and Kim, I saw you said that the snow melted and that's true. This morning as we woke up, it was There was snow this morning when we woke up in Victoria, uh, but as you can see, it's already gone for now. So Chris and Elise said they were on the sixth floor and uh, they were heading into the back hallway. I should know what's on the sixth floor, but I get all of the numbers confused. <laughs> So we'll have to, I'll be just as surprised uh, as you are when we come back to see where they are. You can put your guess in the chat. So they mentioned, we saw fish on the wall. So maybe it's the ichthyology collection. That's the collection for fish. Uh, maybe though, sometimes things are mixed around. What else could we have? Ooh, it could be could be history offices on the sixth floor. I hope they come back and show us soon. <laughs> Before COVID, uh, we did tours in the Fannin Tower the collection tower where Chris and Elise are right now. Oh, insects, guesses Janet. So Chris, we lost you and now you're sideways and muted. Janet thinks that you might be in the insect collection. Is she right? Janet is as always right. If oh, this is, is the Janet that I think. <laughs> it might um, be, yes. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Kim, we, were, uh, we weren't on data, we were on Wi-Fi and that's why we were kept uh, going in and out more. So, um, but you can hear, can you hear me okay? Yes, I'm very happy you're back. Okay, good. <laughs> we're very happy to be back too. Um, so yeah, we're on the sixth floor. The sixth floor is the entomology area. It's where all the insects and spiders are. This, there are so hundreds of thousands of specimens in big ca uh, cabinets like this. Each cabinet has all of these kinds of drawers. Um, like that, <laughs> an incredibly big moth. I'm gonna look at these in particular, um, these moths, which are called polyphemus moths. And they're often known as giant moths because these, and I'm just gonna take off the top so you can see, see it a little bit better. So these are called polyphemus moths. Um, and they're one of the biggest moths that we have in BC. And you might wonder, like, why do we have so many? And the reason is because we want to collect, when we're collecting nets for the museum, we want to collect 
uh, animals and plants from many, many different time periods and many, many different areas of the, of the province because not all insects, not all animals are the same. And this is a good example because these are all um, the polyphemus moths. Um, and it might look like maybe some are younger than old, the others, but these are all this, essentially the same um, age, because um, but they're all different sizes. And, and mostly it's thought that, that the reason for that is probably of what they've ate, eaten, um, which may, may maybe make some bigger than, than others. So there's this one that's huge and this one that's smaller. Um, one thing that I find that incredibly uh, endearing about these is the antenna have this kind of like feathery um, nature to their um, to their uh, antenna, and that's because they these moths will will fly at night, so they really need the antenna to sense uh, what's around them. Um, so, uh, and then also you'll notice that with the the wings the they almost look like eyes and there's a reason for that if they look like eyes if they're resting and you see something that looks like an eye and you're an animal and you might be scared of that animal you'll you'll stay away from this moth so it's a protective mechanism to have some, um this then their their wings have uh, make it look like they're something that they're not so these are um these are moths and again, we have hundreds of thousands of specimens of insects, uh, all different kinds of insects all throughout here. And like I was mentioning, it's really important that we um, collect, continue to collect and we collect and show the whole diversity of animals within BC. And those are, so that's something that would, here, I'm just gonna turn the camera around here. Um, that's something that we would, um, that you would see flying. But what about something that is in the ocean? So we're actually gonna go up this spiral staircase. Um, <laughs> so Alicia's gonna go up the spiral staircase and I'm gonna come up, yeah. And I'm gonna switch the microphone over to Elise. All right. Talk about cool staircases, huh? <laughs> All right, so. We are heading here to this giant barnacle. Now, if you here, get a closer look at it, that's, now here it is in comparison to my hand. So it's about almost the size of my hand. Um, it's pretty big. <laughs> um, so these barnacles, it's called an acorn barnacle, giant acorn barnacle. They're actually crustaceans. So they are cro closely related to, um, things like shrimp and crabs and lobster because they have their bodies and they have a shell, but then they have this big outer shell that you can see, big rocky thing. And it's pretty much all you think of when you see a barnacle. Like when you see a barnacle in the ocean, um, next time you see a barnacle in the ocean, think about how, yes, you can see the stuff on the outside, but there's actually a big creature living on the inside. And this is just its protective shell. So basically, once, um, once these barnacles um, are children, they sort of float and swim around and then they find rocks and they stick on them and they produce um, these things. It's almost, they produce this, uh, almost, it's almost like cement. Um, and so they stick onto these rocks. You can see on the bottom here, you can sort of see it like there's little parts where they produce this like cement like substance they attach on the rock and then slowly they build this giant fortress around themselves and so they basically and once they're like that once they have this they stay like that for life so they can't move around and they're just kind of stuck there but as you've probably seen if you visited some tide pools or something like that um, whenever they have to feed, this top hatch here opens and the little creature inside has these little feathery sort of appendages that sweep along in the tide and 
they catch little plankton, so little, little tiny animals and uh, organisms that basically is their food. Um, yeah, and most barnacles live in the intertidal zone, which means well, if you've visited our submarine, you probably maybe have heard that word before. So that's like right in between low tide and high tide. So it's kind of like if you've been out to the beach, you know that barnacles aren't right at the front. But if you walk a little bit out on the tide, they're kind of in the middle almost. And that's because um, usually they need water. But so they're mostly covered by water most of the day. And so whenever they're covered in water, they open this up and they can start feeding. Yeah. So, right. So we're gonna head up stairs now to one last, I think, yes. Oh yeah, are there any, if there are any questions, just type them in the chat and we will do our best to answer them. Where are we going next? Good question. So next we are going to the history collections. So those are like human history and things like that. And so we're gonna see something that actually until recently, very recently was in the gallery. And Chris is gonna talk more about that when we get there. Yes. So one thing Kim, you were saying earlier, how tall the tower is. One way you can get a sense of how tall it is is there's, there it is to the very top, the 14 floors. And then I'm gonna go down to show you all the way down. Don't drop the camera. <laughs> um, so it's this tower, there is uh, so many floors, but also so many, um, so many, uh, each floor has so many different objects and collections within it. And now I'm gonna hand the camera back off to Elise. Yeah, so everywhere we were, we're yeah, actually maybe as the background is. <laughs> so from the basement all the way up to this, that last floor is all natural history. And now from this floor up to the 14th floor is all human history related objects. So we're gonna go on to the, into the eighth floor. This is our last floor for today. And this is our uh, non-Indigenous uh, human history collection area. And this area, you'll have to <laughs> careful at least because you have to like move around a lot of packing equipment and a lot of uh, different kinds of uh, things that are laid out. Usually when new objects are brought into the museum, uh, we use this room here to be able to do an assessment of them and be able to do a little check of them. And, but, but the one the thing that I'm gonna show you today actually is a different way that it's come into the collection because it's already in the collection, but it basically has come back to the collection. So these are, does anyone know in the chat what these are? Can I what give are we a hint? looking at? It's more than meets the eye. <laughs> does anyone know? Does anyone recognize what these things are? Yeah, and the. Yes, That's Jesse. Right. Yeah. yeah. You see, there's, uh, it says transformers. So these are transformers. Um, transformers, uh, you might have noticed these actually in the gallery, because these were in what's called Century Hall in the display that showed the 80s and 90s uh, decades. Um, and as a kid who grew up in the 80s, uh, I was 10 years old in 1984 when Transformers came out. So I love Transformers. Uh, and these, uh, they were first uh, invented in Japan. Uh, and then uh, the company in Japan worked with a company Hasbro in the States. To, to bring it basically over to North America. Um, and then because these things that are toys of, of um, figures 
robots that turn into cars and then can turn back into their like their animal form if it's a bird or a robot um all of these transformers had stories connected to them so then there were comics and um, a tv show and there's and it became this whole sort of cultural phenomenon so when we think about the 80s in terms of toys there's so many different kinds of toys that would represent the the 1980s um, but Transformers, and it, people still play with Transformers today, so it, it has staying power. But it's one of those things when you think of the 80s, it's one of the, one of the toys. But that's the thing about, just like with animal diversity, with human history as well, there's so much diversity in terms of who played with what toys, what kind of toys. And for a museum, it's really important to collect as many different kinds of things to represent uh, so many different experiences, whether it's toys or um, or anything really. And so these were in the museum right now. So they were taken out of the Century Hall display uh, when we're closing the third floor to do a, a check and a preserve the, the things that were there. So all of these things that were on the third floor will come back into the collection area here. Um, so that's an exciting process just to get a sense of what is actually in our collection. Um, and, and actually here, in addition to the Transformers, another thing that I think of as a kid of the 1980s, but also it's people play it now too, uh, is Mario Brothers, Nintendo, which I played a lot of when I was, when I was 10 years old. So, um, so that, that gives a little sense of, we started, uh, Lisa and I started on the third floor with botany, we went up, we went past the paleontology collection, we went up to the bird collection, the or ornithology collection, then up to um, invertebrate, uh, the entomology collection, then the, um, the invertebrate collection, and now we're up at the human history collection. So we've only saw, seen just a small little portion of the collection here at the museum. Um, but we wanted to give you a little like peek into what what is here and what's uh, what's here? So, um, Elise, do you want to say any final words? But also, we if we have any questions, um, Kim, if you have any questions, or if anyone in the, the chat has any questions, let us let us know. I don't see any questions, but there's uh, people really appreciating the chance to see this uh, part of the museum and saying thank you yeah we're happy to show it to you guys and another thing i just noticed here there's some cool little spoons here i don't know that much about them but i think it's really cool that when you're coming through these collection spots there can be anything like yeah you can see anything from our history and it's really important to see that and so we kind of hope that through showing you guys this history that um it can become something that maybe someone watching is potentially interested in as a career or wants to just learn more about because you think it's cool. Um, and those type of things are really important to the museum and to us. So we really hope that you guys enjoyed this tour and you got a lot out of it. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll say, I'll say one more thing. Just, uh, to echo what um, Elise was saying too, is that um, museums are all about us as people, as families, as individuals around BC. So what's in the museum should reflect all of us. So those are all decisions that we all make together in terms of what's important, what should be in a museum, what should be preserved. And uh, so we're all part of that process. We want as many stories as possible to be reflected in a, in a collection like this that tries to represent the entire province. So um, thank you so much, Elise, for uh, being my, my co-guide on this tour. And thanks so much for everyone out there for, for joining in. And Kim, thanks so much for uh, being uh, so patient as, <laughs> as the nature of a, of a tower tour sometimes can be a little glitchy uh, in terms of technology. But uh, thanks so much, Kim uh, and Sarah. And, um, and until next time, 
hopefully next time uh, we'll be able to explore a few more of the floors here at the museum. All right, thanks everyone. Bye.